He's an expert in the art of bad taste and do-it-yourself filmmaking. Driven by a savage sense of humour, Jackson's been making movie magic out of sex, drugs and soft toys. Saying hop a basking in the sun, a dancing and a hopping, having lots of fun. I feel the sand landed in that hopper's eye. And the little sand hopper said, My oh my, I got one leg missing. I got one leg missing. I got one leg missing. How do I get around? Shiny, shiny, fishy in the ocean blue. I swam into a sewage pipe, poo, poo, poo. Said I'm in the shit, I better take a dive. Stuck his head out the water and began to die. I got one leg missing. Do I get around? Alright! Jackson made Meet the Feebles in a derelict railway's good shed. For the winter of 89, Shed 12 became a Feebles factory. Reporter Kevin Isherwood talked to Peter Jackson about Feebles and filmmaking. One of my favourite quotes is from Alfred Hitchcock. Um, and he says that... Uh, he says, I, I don't make films that are slices of life, I make slices of cake. And uh, that, I mean, that's a, a marvellous quote, and it's exactly, you know, the sort of thing that I, that I um, think as well. I mean, the films that I want to make, or have made, um, are definitely slices of cake. Meet Heidi, the hippo, star of the Feebles variety show. Cake is just one of her vices. She has her hands full satisfying her fans, her lover, and her healthy appetite. Will that be all for Heidi? Something to take away, maybe? I mean, I'm a, a, a quite a selfish filmmaker, and that the movies that I'm making are um, exactly the type of films that I would want to go out and watch myself. So I just think that... Um, the movie making is is an extension of a sort of childhood fantasies because I was as a kid I was always um, playing with um, wooden bricks and creating castles and matchbox toys and and, and um, creating little stories in my head and I just don't think I've ever grown out of that phase. Jackson was hooked on moving pictures and visual effects from an early age. As a nine-year-old, he made his first film with his parents' eight mil camera. For this World War II story, he poked pinholes in the film strip to give the effect of gunfire. Later, he toyed with stop-frame animation and invented his own backyard special effects. The reason why I started making these little films was really because I was wanting to put my models onto film. I just used to love model making kit sets, making things out of cardboard. And I just um, was intrigued by the idea of actually shooting these models and making little stories up. I never wanted to become a director. Um, that was never my ambition for a long time. It was I would just wanted to be a special effects man in movies. It was not until later that I, I started to do little story movies. In 1987, Jackson made his first assault on the cinema-going public with bad taste. A sci-fi splatter comedy, it began as a 10-minute home movie shot on weekends. But after four years, it developed into a full-length cinema feature. Today, it's a cult movie. Jackson's outrageous visual tricks make a shocking mess on the big screen. <laughs> type of shocks that are in the feebles are, are, are um, similar to the type of shocks that are in bad taste and that you, you are do, showing something pretty extreme. That um, is so ridiculous that, that it can't help but make people laugh. I mean, that's, that's exactly the type of, um, of, of humour that I like. I mean, I don't like making shocking films. I don't like making violent, violent films. I don't like violence, but um, I like humour. And th there is that type of humour that is savage. And... <laughs> Hey, 
Oh, what am I gonna do now? It took me six months to train that lot. There is this um, incredibly magical part to it at the beginning where you're you're basically writing it or, or creating it in your head um, with other people and you're coming up with the ideas and you're seeing it all in your mind as the perfect movie. And then it suddenly turns into a factory, which is this nasty bit in the middle, which you have to actually get nuts and bolts and hammers and nails and a lot of people and make it put the images onto film. And it's never as good as you see in your mind. It's always depressing and it's a lot of hard work and it goes on for months and months. And, um, and then it slowly uh, becomes magical again. It's used almost like claws its way back from being um, this um, thing that's come off a production line into becoming something that's magical as you're, at, as you're editing the pictures together and you're adding sound effects and you're adding music and step by step and finally in the end you're back to, um, you're back to a magical product. Puppet maker Cameron Chittick had the task of creating the feeble cast. Certainly, uh, creatively, it's been pretty good. You know, like a hundred characters. Mm. Um, I've had a lot of freedom, and it certainly progressed my um, puppet making ability quite a bit. Um, being forced to make that many characters quickly, you um, have to make some decisions pretty quickly. Um, but also, um, the the pressure um, in terms of having to get all the puppets made on time with very little money um, has been pretty tough going too. Pretty um, intense. Yeah, yeah, and and other things happens too, where whereby you know, you've just you've just completed the puppet. You know, you've sweated away for seven days to get this puppet made, and then Peter will come along and say, "Oh, oh, it's great. You know, it's really, really good." But wouldn't it be nice if the eyes could move? You know, we've just made the puppet so that it doesn't have moving eyes and it's got eyelids. But and, and it's back to the drawing board. Yeah, yeah. The whale was a puppet maker's nightmare to build. It's at least 20 feet long, and it takes no less than six people to drive it. It's the largest puppet in the film, but it had to be capable of having some very quick, violent movements, which. It's pretty difficult to get with such a large puppet. The feebles are made of cheap stuff, just plastic foam and glue. So puppet maker doubles as puppet surgeon. Heidi's hands have been through the wars quite a bit. She's had to eat chocolate cake. She's had to carry a very heavy machine gun. So the hands need to be replaced. A lot of the other puppets have their heads blown off, their arms blown away, shotgun wounds in the bodies and all this sort of thing. So those parts have to be replaced quite regularly. It's quite a major part of my job is actually to maintain the puppets as well. Inside the railway shed, the world of the Feebles is constructed from scrap metal, hardboard, plastic and demolition timber and rebuilt daily. For the three-month shoot, as Jackson films one scene, in another part of the shed, the crew recycle and repaint for the next. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. Oh, my God. Paid only half the industry's hourly rate, they have to find small-budget solutions to big-budget problems. Like model maker Richard Taylor, their payoff is the unique experience. Richard, making a, a stretch model limo, Mori, sounds like a lot of fun, but it probably is quite difficult. Um, yeah, very tricky one, this, this one. It's probably one of the more difficult um, tasks that I've been set as far as a model maker goes. The Mori is famous because it is made up of a series of curves. There isn't actually a straight line in a Morris Minor. So as you can imagine, when you tackle this in a model-making form, it, it becomes quite a major task. It's made up of complex, um, convex curves that not only follow the lines of the panel one way, but also um, follow the bodywork the opposite way. Well, this is the original, or this is the one that's in the film, the stretch limo, isn't it? Why can't you use that? 
instead of going to all this trouble? Well, the reason that uh, M4 miniatures are used is either because of a monetary problem or you want to create a, an environment that you can't create in real life either you want you know for money or it's just not uh, feasible because it because of materials or the locations so we're going to create a location that um, that appeals to the director's ideas and to do that we've got to create miniatures build everything small without giving too much away then what is this model going to get up to well, this, this model, it's not, a, you know, you think miniatures has been small-scale models. This, this model is actually going to be 1.2 metres long. It's got to be large because it's got to do a number of things. That is, um, it's got to be able to steer and power along and turn and skid. It also, at one stage, drives into the whale's mouth to actually kill off the whale and pops out his tail. <laughs> What's mine? Don't try to stop us. You're out of your league, little fella. Kiss your ass. Good boy. <laughs> Take him out, Trevor. <laughs> But where does a feeble get a new suit? How difficult has it been making costumes for these not real people, these extraordinarily shaped puppets and characters? Um, very difficult because they're all such awkward sizes. Everything had to be draped, every single garment that had to be made for the puppets, which was a, a huge amount, had to be draped with cloth and then we worked from there and you set us our pattern. Someone like Cedric, for example, I mean, how on earth do you make a, um, a garment for a creature that's that extraordinary? <laughs> Well, you start with the base of a calico and work, and then you end up with leather. For this one, I actually draped it onto a base and then worked off from that and built the leather around Enormous it. Enormous scale. Well, he's a bikey, so he's, he's got a lot <laughs> tough. A big bikey. Yeah. And these are his, um, his trousers. Those are his leather pants. Yeah. He is, yeah, he is rather big. He's got a big bum. He has a very strange <laughs> bottom. <laughs> <laughs> he's very Poor hunched Cedric. over. He is, it's an odd shape. Interesting, though. The other end of the scale, of course, we've got something like that, these tiny little boots. Who are they for? Those are for Winyard. I use the size in this knife-throwing scene. These are little children's boots that we brought and use carbog to make the toes a bit more exciting and a few bits of detail in silver. I don't think any real actress would be seen dead <laughs> <laughs> shaped like that. I mean, she's an extraordinary woman. How do you go about draping, as it were, a figure of that shape? Mm, it's a nightmare. She's very awkward. You can't... I think this is a woman, therefore I'm going to use a size 12 pattern or a 15 or an 18 or a 20. You have to actually work with the fabric and pleat and dart where is necessary, which on this puppet was very difficult, especially working through different areas. No waist, <laughs> hardly any bottom. What size um, bust are we talking about? Two metres. Making movies is really a, a, um, an ingenious process at the best of times for all departments. And I think that New Zealanders are probably um, ideally suited to it because we are very ingenious. And the fact that we're making a, um, a film like this and we're doing it on an old railway shed, it's freezing cold, hence the fact we're wearing coats. Um, I mean, you know, it's, there's times that we're filming in here and there's mist on our breaths, it's so freezing. And uh, the set has been knocked together out of bits of 4 by 2 and um, chipboard, particle board, and um, there's just so much detail on the set that's made out of um, made out of paint lids, you know, paint tin lids and yoghurt pots, and um, it's just, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's exciting because you're creating an, an illusion, the whole thing, which is one of the things that I like so much about filmmaking, is the, um, the whole, you know, the, as I say, the magical thing, the creating of illusion, and the... Um, the fact that you're, you're, you, you know, what people see on the screen comes from a place like this is, um, is just quite amazing. Play that. Scene 97. Hold on, it's a good day. 
This is a historic moment, Arthur. Tonight, we rocket into superstardom. It's a honor to be a part of it, Mr. Bleach. OK, we cut. All the dialogue tracks were recorded before we started shooting because the easiest way to make a film like this is to have your dialogue, um, your, your voices of your characters already recorded on a tape and then just do the puppeteering to playback. Um, so in actual fact what I've had to do is direct the film twice. Before we ever started shooting I spent three days in a studio with um, some actors and directed their performance all the way through vocally and I mean obviously while I was doing that I had to think of the visual nature of the film as well because if um, you know if they were for instance going to um, be saying a, a line of dialogue while they were getting up off a chair you've actually got to make it sound as if they are you know they've got to put a bit of effort into their voices so I actually had to have it pretty clear in my mind what the pictures were going to be that were going to be um, um, linked up with this with these voices um, and it was an interesting exercise because by having all the voice track recorded before we ever shot I was able to sit down at home lie on the on the couch and shut my eyes and basically just run the tape through the whole 90 minutes of it and um, and just visualize the, the movie Jackson's hands-on approach means he directs and operates the camera sign coming up. I um, made a decision right at the beginning that I'd be the camera operator on the Feebles. Um, it's not because I'm a particularly good camera operator, but I, I've just come from a background where I've sort of shot everything I've made. I, um, my Super 8 movies that I made when I was young, I was operating the camera on. I did most of the camera operating on bad taste, and um, I think the thought of just sitting back as a director on the Feebles was actually a little bit of a worry to me. I, I, I just wanted to be in there and, and more involved. The other advantage too was that because the puppets are your performers and the, just the nature of the puppeteering and the way that they um, come across on camera, unless you're looking right down the lens at what you're getting, um, you're never quite sure of, of the, the, um, the way the puppets are coming across. They look different from certain angles. Right now, the, the thing, the stage, oh, hang on. It's all wrong. All wrong, guys. Let's just forget about it. Well, I bought that one. Everything was wrong. The, the stage started turning too soon. The sign came up too soon. It was all wrong. Yeah, ready, guys? Put your hands together for the fabulous Feebles Variety Hour. Meet the Feebles, meet the Feebles, we're not your average. Ordinary people meet the Feebles, meet the Feebles. This is a historic moment. Tonight, we rocket into superstardom. It's important to be a part of more than this. How difficult is it to direct puppets as opposed to human actors? Um, well, of course, what you are in effect doing is directing the puppeteers, although it's, it's interesting because you get so jaded on a shoot like this that half the time you're not actually directing the puppeteers at all you're um you you're, you're not looking you're not talking to the puppeteers down below you're actually looking straight at the faces of the puppets and you're asking the puppet the puppet to do things you have to sort of shake your head from time to time and, and stop yourself doing that because you because you, you do start to think of them as characters <laughs> you go inside the store and where we keep them all and you walk in and although they're all lifeless sort of stuck on on hooks or on poles um you actually know them all and you and you almost expect them to turn and talk to you and you know each of their characteristics and their personalities it's um, it's really weird blurring of reality and it is yeah we, we call it feebleitis oh dear The most important thing, thing is uh, to give life to the puppets, to make a special personality in every puppet. Uh, we have to think about how the actor voice it is and how the puppet is made, and then we have to, to start working. How's the puppet gonna move? How's the feelings the puppet has inside? And what sort of situations we can create with the puppet? 
and we start giving life to the puppet. I think it's the most important thing. Does he come alive? Oh, yes, he comes alive very, very easily because he has these wonderful, wonderful big eyes. They have a lot of expression. And he has a wonderful face that is really cute. And these tiny, tiny little fingers, <laughs> then you can create more of this. He does have a personality of his own, doesn't he? Oh, yes. He's, uh, when I grabbed this puppet the first time, I just start working with him and I, in, I don't know, one hour, I just could move it. Fell in love with him. Yes. <laughs> It's only at the end of the day, when viewing the rushes, that Jackson and the crew finally see what's worked. <laughs> but getting a couple of feebles to talk and smoke cigars is relatively simple. Uh, what's much more difficult is to get a puppet to, to walk into a room, open the door, walk across to the other side and, and sit at a desk. I mean, that is so difficult because if you were doing it with, with humans if you were shooting a normal drama you'd probably just do it in one camera shot stick the camera there they come and walk across and sit down but with puppets it's impossible to make them do that type of movement in one shot I mean because so you've got to split something that simple up into two or three different camera angles and you've got to shoot a separate shot of them walking to the door where you have to maybe take the floor out and get them in and then you cut because it's as far as their puppeteer's arm can reach. You can't get any, any further. So then you have to take more of the floor out and rig a dolly so that you can wheel him across the room as he makes the puppet walk across. But then he can't get up into the chair because you'd see the arm that's stuck up the puppet. So then you've got to change your angle and hide the arm with a desk or something else, a prop, and then he sits up. So to do the most simple action, the most basic sort of action is... Um, um, it's just time-consuming and difficult. We've got to talk. We've got a crisis on our hands. Winyard's killed his assistant. Our oh, bees out of action. Sid's routine is a complete write-off. We've got no alternative but to reinstate my song. No! Bitch, I'm sorry, but the show is in a shambles. This is a family show, for Christ's sake. The network would never allow it. But it's a superb piece of song and dance. I know it'll go down. Well, let's get into this scene, Peter. This is the, um, we've had a lot, of, lot, there's a lot of trouble with the old yeah, well, wires this is, and this is, this. this is a scene that I really dreaded shooting. I oh, know, it's a lot of dreaded cut. <laughs> Well, I know we just had enormous difficulty with these um, strings because I was trying to get um, full-length shots of Sebastian. You can, and just, I mean, all the time I was seeing the strings through the camera, but I yeah. just hoped like hell that we were going to get a bit that... Um, well, you, could you sort of cut enough shots so we can get them up on the desk, all right? When so, we um, come to edit the yeah, movie, it's the, um, the first the time that the magic slowly starts yeah, to filter yeah, back yeah. for me. It's been broken down into tiny little fragments, shots that by themselves are just meaningless, but you finally start to see it join back together again and it comes, you know, hopefully comes close to the um, original idea that you conceived. Yeah, okay. We're going to hold the moon back there and we're going to tape the black cloth up and we're going to do a shot of the Feebles doing the closing number, meet the Feebles two verses. Then we're going to take the moon back down, rig the machine gun up, put Heidi on it, pull it back, set the bomb, rele bomb releases, and away we go. Actor Danny Mulheron doesn't usually get about like this. He's one of the script writers for Feebles, but he's also the man in Heidi's life. It's hot work wearing a hippopotamus, clothes or no clothes, so the crew turn a blind eye when he rehearses naked. OK, get, grab the shooter. Got the shooter, Johnny? Alright. Yeah, I've got to see the line there. It's down the line, that black tape down the middle. Can someone hold the gun? So it doesn't swing around. We need the shooter. You there, Don? Yeah, you're. Keep on coming. Heidi is the strangest role Mulheron has played and the most difficult to shake off. How on earth do you get out of this thing? Uh, head first. If the right, right. If you turn. Uh, uh, pull it. Yeah. Uh, this oh, one. gently. Oh, it's heavy. You good. Why don't you sit yeah. down? <laughs> Great. Thank you. What's, what's it like being stuck inside that big blob of it's, bone rubber all day? It's, it's smelly. And that gives you a real pain in the neck, especially when you're horizontal, because it sort of 
pulls back. But it's, it's quite good. It smells like rancid butter. Oh, yeah. I've been wearing it for about a couple of months now, so it's rather... Rather aromatic. <laughs> Pretty unpleasant. Yeah. How do the other guys on the show treat you when you're uh, dressed up in one of your more sexy numbers? Oh, the sexy numbers? Well, it's, it, it changes. When I'm in a sort of regal outfit, they sort of, I've got an entourage of people and I sort of want to around and hundreds of people follow me. But when I'm in one of the outfits which are sort of more revealing, well, uh, you know, people leap on top of me, basically, really? which is sort of rather unnerving. How but do you, it, it how do you cope with that? Well, you've got to just take it in the stride, really. There's not a lot I can do. I can't actually tell who it is. <laughs> I think I think it was the director at one stage. <laughs> to go some sort of... I think I'm a mother figure. <laughs> close-ups, lads. In a scene that could be called Heidi's Revenge, the hippo triggers a Peter Jackson special of splatter magic and puppet gore. Well, we said it was going to be easy. You know, I do want to make the sort of films that I like watching, so what I've had to try and do with the Feebles is make the, the sort of puppet film that I would like to watch. You know, if I had, had to go and sit down and watch a puppet film for an hour and a half, you know, what would I like to see? And so that's really what I've tried to do with the Feebles. Hi. I'm doing the CO2. Hi. I'm doing the CO2. Oh, yeah? Ah. Oh. I need to put this down. Is this part? I think I need to put this down. It's going down here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, that'll do, Richard. Good vomit work. OK, we'll shoot. Stand by on the carrot. And action carrot. Yeah, that's pretty good speed. No, you got shots of the ones? I haven't given some. I will get the ones down, so they're about to go. I don't want to sound grand and big-headed and stupid, but I mean, I think it will do the film industry good. Um, I think that there's a certain image of, of a New Zealand film, you know, in the audiences in here, in New, you know, in the um, public's mind in New Zealand and overseas, I guess, to an extent, um, of, you know, being quite naturalistic um, types of movies, you know, slices of life rather than slices of cake. And I hope that with... Um, bad taste and, and now with the feebles that um, that people can see that you know that we can make slices of cake in New Zealand just as well as they can overseas we don't have the budgets to, to spend but we um, you know we can we can produce these types of movies too He's like, action adventure and daring describes what we're about to see that's right Brandy our in 